Thank you so much to Rich and Patty. So what immediate steps can be taken to bring this uh, opioid uh, epidemic under control? How can everyone who needs it receive treatment and access to programs that can support a long-term recovery? Next up, we will hear from experts, some of whom have their own personal stories of addiction recovery, to explore the level of services needed at the federal and state levels to help those looking to overcome addiction. Please welcome on stage Arthur Evans, Chief Executive Officer and Executive Vice President of the American Psychological Association. Tom Hill, Vice President of Practice Improvement at the National Council for Behavioral Health. Denise Holden, Founder and CEO of RAISE Project. The RAISE Project, based in central Pennsylvania, has been serving those in or seeking recovery since 2002. And Andre Johnson is President and CEO of the Detroit Recovery Project, a recovery community organization that offers a number of peer-to-peer -peer programs for a life that leaves addiction behind. The Hills Healthcare reporter Rachel Rubine will be leading this conversation. Rachel, over to you. All right, thanks everyone for being here. Special thanks to our panelists as well. Want to just dive right in, kick off the conversation. First question to you, Tom. Um, I'm curious if you can tell us a little bit about what you find some of the key elements in helping towards long-term recovery are, and if you think the nation right now has the infrastructure to support those. So uh, first off, uh, good morning, everybody. And um, I am a person in long-term recovery, and I think I'm the baby on the panel here. Uh, I have a quarter of a century of, of recovery time, but uh, I, I defer to my elders. Um, I, I, um, you know, I think you, know, you can have the best treatment in the world, and somebody can go to the best treatment in the world, but if they leave treatment or incarceration and go to a community that's ill-equipped to support their recovery, we're going to see, you know, disastrous results, and we've seen them again and again. And so, what we talk about is uh, building recovery ecologies and communities, like uh, communities that are rich in recovery resources. Um, as Patty and Rich uh, set us up, you know, those networks exist across the country, um, more in certain areas than others. But what we're talking about is. Uh, when people re-enter their community where they live and where they work and where they breathe, they need a, a, a constellation of recovery supports, housing, collegiate programs, uh, peer services, peer coaching, to help them sustain long-term recovery, especially by building short-term recovery. And those first few months and years are really, really important in terms of people putting together that time, and it's very, very difficult to do on your own. You know, you need a, a, a whole co community of support. And if that's not there, people tend to, to use again and then, and then go back in treatment for, or into incarceration again, um, time and time again. And, and Denise and Andre, you're both on the ground helping do that. Can you tell us a little bit about how you're doing that in Pennsylvania, you're doing that work in Michigan, and what, what services, comprehensive services are needed? Sure. Um, I'm also a person in long-term recovery, and we've been providing services in central Pennsylvania in nine different counties, and we also now provide services in Florida as well. Um, but the services that we provide, we have recovery centers, we have recovery houses, we have recovery coaching, we have warm handoffs in hospital emergency rooms for opiate addicts who have overdosed and been revived with Narcan. We have medication-assisted recovery services that wrap around people who are getting medication-assisted treatment to make sure that they have the recovery support services, like Tom said, that are there for the long haul during and after treatment. And I'll just say this. I'm a person in long-term recovery as well, and that means I haven't used any drugs or alcohol in over, it'll be 30 years this coming July. And, and thank you. And I'll tell you, uh, recovery support service, one of the most vital parts of recovery support services is the fact that people have a lived experience. People can relate, people can identify. Um, you know, the old motto of uh, you can't put a clean fish in dirty water and expect for the fish to stay clean. And I think in the past, that's how we've been operating. It's really, really important to make sure we have recovery support services in every community in this country. And we need people to rally together and partner. At the Detroit Recovery Project, we have an array of support services ranging from housing. We have recovery support housing. 
We have employment and training opportunities. We have recovery coaches helping people link up to go to college, um, trade programs, plumbing, welding. Um, a lot of our people in the city of Detroit um, are coming right off of Skid Row. And it's really hard if you can't uh, address some of the social economic issues that often um, people are faced with, the health challenges. We link people up, we provide, we, we partner with our universities, um, fairly qualified health centers, um, mammogram screenings, prostate screenings, high cholesterol screenings, diabetes screening. Uh, we provide uh, recovery prevention services for the children of the people that we're servicing. I mean, it's all about a full continuum of care. It's just not you go to treatment for 28 days and all your problems are solved. People have uh, a lot of issues, a lot of health challenges, and I've seen it throughout our country. And so I'm really excited to be here because, you know, people like Tom and Dr. Evans and Patty and a number of us have been working boots on the ground for the last 20 years to really elevate the importance of recovery support services. It is its own modality. It's totally different. And we are trained, we are educated, and we are committed to this entire movement. And, and you mentioned a lot of different services there and, you know, some services need funding. Um, Arthur, yes. I'm curious a little bit from you. When um, President Trump announced the declaration, emergency declaration for opioids, which has now been extended another 90 days, um, you said in a statement that was a good step, but that more funding was needed. The Congress passed $6 billion over a two-year period. Do you think that's enough? What should the money go go towards? How much should there really be? Well, sure. I, um, first of all, thank you for inviting me to be here. I, I think this is great, and I really appreciate the emphasis on recovery and recovery support services. Um, just as background, um, you know, I'm a psychologist. I'm, I'm probably the one, well, I am the only person who's not in uh, recovery, uh, at least recovery from Honorary. addiction. Yeah, I'm, I'm recovery from uh, government work, but uh, <laughs> other than that, uh, I don't have a recovery history. But I've worked in the field for 30 years, and, and um, most recently uh, in Connecticut and in Philadelphia as a commissioner. And the one thing that I, I know is that uh, the kinds of services that you're, we, we've talked about today are enormously important. Uh, my agency, uh, the last agency that I, I worked at, uh, spent about $2 million every day on treatment services. Uh, I can tell you that those services weren't as effective when we didn't have the kinds of re uh, recovery support services that you're, you're hearing about today. So uh, two things about, I think, the, where the administration is on this issue. One is, uh, let's put the amount of money, $6 billion, which sounds like a lot of money, in perspective. Our country will spend $3.2 trillion on health care this year. If you look at $6 billion, given the number of lives that this epidemic is taking each day, uh, the number of lives that this is impacting, I think, and I think many people agree, would agree, that uh, as you, you heard um, uh, Congressman uh, talk about, that this is a, a, a first step. And I hope it really is viewed as a first step because I do think we need more resources. The other uh, thing that I, I believe has been missing in the way we've been looking at this problem is that we need to look at it more comprehensively. Um, absolutely, we need to put the resources in treatment and treatment resources. But if we are serious about this issue, this is an issue that every part of our government needs to be a part of. Uh, one of the big challenges for many systems is the issue of housing, for example. I want to hear what is the, the administration's view around how HUD is going to help. Uh, we know that um, uh, the issue of education and people getting back on their feet is enormously important. Uh, we have a lot of research that shows that things like supportive empo employment, supportive uh, education can be very helpful in helping people in the recovery process. The point is that if we are serious about this issue, uh, it's not only going to take the HHS agencies working on this, uh, it's going to take every part of our government working on this. Every part of our government has a role, and I'd like to see a much more comprehensive look at how we're approaching this. Absolutely. Can I just jump in? 
Yeah, please clap. Um, you know, while we were busy in the last 15, 20 years figuring out how to make this work on the ground, people like Arthur were showing us how to do it systemically in uh, state and muni municipal governments, of how to fold recovery support systems uh, services into an entire continuum of care, how to fund it, how to make it all work, how to work with numerous stakeholders. So we really owe a debt of gratitude to Arthur and other folks who, who f figured out how to architect a lot of these things on a grander scale. And, you know, I think uh, one thing we always hear is that people will, will short hit hand, it'll say, when I say treatment, I mean all, all, the whole full continuum. I think that's really dangerous. I think we always have to name out recovery support services because we're all, often the, the, the first on the chopping block and the first to go. And I think we've really demonstrated how important these services are in terms of helping people and, and communities achieve long-term recovery. Um. Uh, we, we did hear earlier Senator Whitehouse talk about working on another uh, 2.0 version of the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act. So, Tom, what would you like to see in that bill in terms of, you know, naming out recovery services? So, you know, I think it's important for everyone in this room and everyone in the world to know that CARE has started off as, uh, from people in the recovery community a, a, as a way to, st to start talking about this in a much larger way. And as at all bills and acts, things change along the way. And we didn't really, our, the recovery advocates didn't really get what we wanted out of CARE, which is all right. It's, it's great it happened. So with CARE 2.0, we really want to be able to see uh, re recovery support services in, in all their forms named out in a way that we don't have to continue to rely on grant funding, which is great and we love it, but grant funding ends and then we can't sustain programs. We need sustainable funding for these things like we, like we fund all other kinds of services. Mm -hmm. And I um, wanted to talk a little bit about just stigma. Where do you think the country is in terms of addressing stigma and what, what sort of the importance that that plays in recovery? Andre, maybe can you kick us off with that? Sure. I think that <clears throat> we're getting better. Uh, we're having this conversation, which is really uh, indicative of the fact that recovery is right here on the screen live. Um, but I think given some of the major deaths we had in this country, people like Prince and uh, Michael Jackson and Whitney Houston and, um, you know, those incidents, unfortunately, has really increased people's awareness around the seriousness of pills and prescription drugs and, and this illness. And, and people are having more conversations about, oh, this really is a chronic disease. Uh, because I still hear a lot of people think that um, addiction is a moral issue, it's a religious issue, uh, which it's not. It's a, a brain disease, and it has to be treated as a chronic disorder. And I think people are starting to get it. We can no longer just provide a Band-Aid and say, you're going to be okay after 30 days. No, we need funding. We need support. And people in recovery with the lived experience can help people sustain long-term recovery. When you talk about services, we do meditation at our recovery center. We're now doing yoga at our recovery center. And we're providing people with coping skills that they can have where they can remain drug-free, criminal-free in their communities and no longer feel stigmatized. We can walk and keep our heads up right now. I mean, to be in a community and to be in a room full of people like this, I would be terrified to say, you know, I'm a person in recovery. What do they think of me? You know, uh, it's, a, it's the stigma is, it, it has to be erased. But um, we still have a long way to go. We have a lot of work to do to erase this stigma and, and to disgrace the fact that there's a shame related to this issue. I lost my mother from a substance use disorder. I lost my mother who was a registered nurse who had a overdose of prescription. And why should I be embarrassed about that? Why should I be ashamed about that? And my 12-year-old brother found it. What's, I mean, this is a community devastation. And we have to work to solve it as a community. The dope man has not stopped selling drugs at 5 o'clock p.m. 
So why do we got to stop providing services at 5 o'clock p.m.? <laughs> why we don't have support services 24-7, 365 days a week? And the only way we can do that is by having this conversation and really understanding how do we reallocate, redirect, shift funds, partner with other government organizations, and continue to work to increase community awareness about what this is versus what it's not. Denise, what, what are you seeing in terms? <laughs> yeah, pow powerful stories there. Denise, what are, what are you seeing on um, the ground in terms of stigma where you are? Well, we have come so far from where we were uh, 19, 20 years ago. Um, and a lot of that came about as uh, the RCSP grants were offered uh, through SAMHSA, and they uh, allowed us to do community grassroots organizing, and we began doing education and advocacy services. And then ARCO has helped us continue to do those things. And there, were a t there was a time when we all hid and were so afraid to come out and say, you know, we're in recovery for fear of uh, what would happen if the insurance companies knew or the housing people knew or any our employers knew. And so now, you know, uh, the RAISE project employs 56, 57 people who are in long-term recovery. People in the recovery process become some of the most valued, productive uh, members of society. And so being able to speak openly about it has been such, has, has done so much for this movement, whereas 19 or 20 years ago, hardly anybody was talking about it. I mean, you'd hear little pockets of it, and you know, people recovered in anonymous recovering programs, but we weren't able to go out there and say, Hi, I'm a person in long-term recovery, and I'm proud of that. And I think that speaks volumes. And yes, we have more to do and further to go, but this is a great start. And just being here today is amazing that you've given us this opportunity. Can I just add one thing? Yeah. Um, it, you know, I think one area that, that, that keeps popping up and we need to keep looking at is the, the, the stigma and shame around medication-assisted recovery. And as a movement, we've really made an effort to say all pathways to recovery, yeah. and we include medication-assisted recovery, but traditionally people using medication, especially methadone patients, Same were denied time. the identity of being in recovery on a number of levels. And for a number of reasons. And we don't need to go into that, but we need to embrace everybody uh, establishing every pathway and remove all of that stigma and shame as well. Um, and we will turn, we'll turn it over to audience Q&A in just a few minutes. So be thinking if you have any uh, questions for our panelists. Um, Arthur, I wanted to ask you, you worked in Philadelphia at the Department of Behavioral Health working to sort of, sort of drive recovery there. Can, can you tell us a little bit about what you saw that work there that maybe other localities, other states might look at emulating? Well, I think the first thing uh, is, uh, you know, you heard, uh, you know, Tom, Denise, uh, Andre talk about um, their own personal recovery. And I think one of the most powerful things that has happened in our field is uh, uh, putting a face on recovery. Uh, as my friend Bill White often says, people know what addiction looks like. They see it. Uh, what we haven't been good at is putting a face on what recovery looks like. Uh, this isn't what people think about when they think about people who have, uh, who have had a, an addiction disorder. So the, the, um, I think that that is really important because it sets the context within a community. Um, I, you know, I appreciated hearing the, the Surgeon General talk about uh, how it's important to work with law enforcement. In, in Philadelphia, we worked uh, very closely with law enforcement, um, training police officers on how to recognize behavioral health challenges, working with the prison system, changing the context, because the issues of addiction don't just show up in treatment programs. They show up in communities. They show up in all kinds of places and communities. And when communities have people, whether they're in law enforcement, they're in child welfare, they're in the educational system, who understand, can recognize those issues, and know how to intervene, it begins to create a network within the community that begins to change how the issue is dealt with. We have to start thinking about this, my view, from a public health standpoint. If our only solution is to create treatment and try to get people into treatment, we're going to fail tremendously on this issue. Part of the reason is that only 10% of the people who have an addiction 
uh, actually reach treatment. Uh, and the 80% the, of the people, or of the 90% who aren't going to treatment, uh, don't even believe they need treatment. So if we have this passive strategy of waiting for people to show up, we're just going to miss many millions of people who need our help. So we have to have these, uh, these other strategies. So that would be one uh, issue. I think the other issue is the framework around how we think about addiction. The, you know, the science around addiction tells us that this is a chronic condition. We have set up our treatment services and our treatment systems on an acute care model, meaning the minute that a person no longer is symptomatic, we cut off the resources for the person. And you heard uh, from both the senator, the, the, the congressman, uh, the surgeon general, that you need this long-term support for people. Uh, that's a philosophical shift that we have to make in terms of how we set up our systems, how we train people, how we set up policy, particularly financing policy, which um, often doesn't support people long term in long-term recovery. Um, and then we have to make sure that we are bringing in the best science. Um, I'm a psychologist, uh, believe in the research. Uh, psychologists do a lot of that research uh, on what works. We need to be bringing that in. And one of the things that I, I'm most proud of in, in the work that uh, we did in Philadelphia is bringing in evidence-based treatment approaches for people in the public sector who often don't get the, the access to uh, many of those evidence-based treatment approaches. That's, but, that's a really great point. I'm just going to cut you off real quick and okay. go to audience Q&A and make sure we get um, a question or two here. Um, over there, the, the third row, ma'am. <coughs> um, hi, my name is Veronica. I'm really representing myself, but I'm a part of the uh, Montgomery County's uh, Alcohol and Other Drug Abuse Advisory Council. Now, we keep talking about the stigma. And the stigma is real, but no one really talks about how drug decriminalization can reduce the stigma associated with drug addiction. Because if you're serious about helping people in recovery, then you'll recognize that you can't get a house or you know an apartment or a job if you have a felony on your record. Let's keep it real. So I want to know from each of you, how do you feel about drug decriminalization as a way to help reduce the stigma associated with drug addiction? I can take a quick stab at it. So for us, uh, you know, we're, in, we're in, a, in a city of Detroit where it's not resource plentiful. Um, but we are very real and realistic when it comes to helping individuals. Uh, and 90 percent of people come to us typically need somewhere to work and somewhere to live. Somewhere to live that's supportive, to their personal recovery. And it really goes back to uh, what Dr. Evans said, is we need long-term strategies. There's not a, everybody, you know, we work with everybody on an individual basis and meet people where their needs are and where they, where they desire to go. Uh, it's a more strength-based recovery approach. We know that people come to us have co-occurring disorders, people come to us having other chronic health conditions, but more importantly, uh, our team are a team of certified recovery coaches that have once had a criminal background. And we know that we're not just trying to give people a job. We're trying to help people connect with career ladder opportunities. That way you can provide for yourself. That way you can become fully self-sufficient and no longer allow the past to haunt you. But thank you for that question, Veronica. And, and I'd, I'd just like to, to add, to, you know, to what Andre said. It's, um, first of all, addiction is not a crime. And I think that's really important for us all to say out loud. Um, sometimes, some of our folks get engaged in criminal activity in order to feed their addiction. We know that. We know that a lot of people in recovery have criminal justice backgrounds. Um, and we know that it's not stigma. It is discrimination. And so if somebody can't get a house or find a place to live or get a job, essential things and essential recovery supports, that's a problem. So we've been advocating for jail diversion programs, for drug court, all those kinds of things. We've been advocating for 20 years and for lifting those bans that keep people from accessing good, honest recovery because of their background. And thank you, every, everybody, for the great conversation. Unfortunately, we're out of time here, but appreciate everyone being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you to our panelists and to Rachel. That brings us to the end of our program. On behalf of The Hill and our sponsors, Faces and Voices of Recovery and Indivier, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, the um, video will be up later today on thehill.com. And uh, just a reminder for those feedback surveys, we are also doing another event here on March 21st, this time on leadership and bipartisan cooperation um, on Capitol Hill. So please do set your calendar for that and have a great rest of your day.